After a few moments of silence, he reverted to the subject of the English invasion. It was supposed, said he, that my scheme was merely a vain threat because it did not appear that I possessed any reasonable means of attempting its execution. But I laid my plans deeply and without being observed. I had dispersed all our French ships and English were sailing after them to different parts of the world. Our ships were to return suddenly and at the same time and to assemble in a mass along the French coasts. I would have had 70 or 80 French or Spanish ships in the channel and I calculated that I should continue master of it for two months. Three or four thousand small vessels were to be ready at a signal. A hundred thousand men were every day drilled in embarking and landing as a part of their exercise. They were full of ardor and eager for the enterprise, which was very popular with the French and was supported by the wishes of a great number of the English. After landing my troops, I calculated upon only one pitched battle, the results of which could not be doubtful, and victory would have brought us to London. The nature of the country would not admit of a war maneuvering my conduct would have done the rest the people of england groaned under the yoke of an oligarchy and feeling that their pride had not been humbled they would have arranged themselves on our side we should have been considered only as allies come to effect their deliverance we should have presented ourselves with the magical words of liberty and equality etc after adverting to a great number of the minor details of the plan, which were all admirable and remarking how very near execution it had been. He abruptly stopped and said, let us go out and take a turn. We walked for some time. It had been raining for three days, but now the weather was perfectly fine. The emperor, not forgetting his resolution to be indoors, always by six o'clock immediately ordered the calash, took a drive and returned home in good time. My son followed on horseback. It was the first time he'd enjoyed such an honor. He acquitted himself very well. And the emperor complimented him on the occasion. The Chinese fleet, the fourth. Today, the emperor received some captains of the China fleet. He conversed a long time with them, respecting their trade, the facility, their intercourse with the Chinese, the manners of that people, etc. The ships which trade to China are from 14 to 1,500 tons burden, nearly equal to 64. So they draw from 22 to 23 feet of water. They are laden almost exclusively with tea. One of those just arrived had nearly 1,500 tons on board. The cargoes of the six ships which came into the road at last night are valued at about 60 millions. And as they will be subject to a duty of 100% on their arrival in England, 120 millions will thus at once be thrown into circulation in Europe. Europeans are allowed very little liberty at Canton. Their residence is chiefly limited to the suburbs. They are treated with the greatest contempt by the Chinese, who assume an air of great superiority and conduct themselves in a very arbitrary manner. The Chinese are very intelligent, industrious, and active, but they are great thieves and extremely treacherous. They transact all business in the European languages, which they speak with facility. The arrival of fleets to St. Helena is... A circumstance equally pleasing to the crews and the inhabitants of the island. The latter sell their merchandise and purchase provisions. The seamen on their part are unable to set foot on land and to refresh themselves. This state of things usually continues for a fortnight or three weeks, but on the present occasion, the Admiral, to the great disappointment of everybody, limited the period of refreshment to two days, only for the two first ships that had anchored off the town. The others were ordered to remain under sail and to come up to the town in succession, two by two. It must be supposed that he has received very strict orders, or is under some very great apprehension of which we are not aware. The emperor walked for some time in the garden before he got into his calash. Among the trees in the neighborhood, we perceived some officers newly arrived at the island who were endeavoring to get a peep at the emperor, the sight of whom seemed to be an object of great importance to them. The fifth, today the emperor conversed a great deal about his court and the etiquette observed in it. The following is the substance of what fell from him on the subject. 
at the period of the revolution. The courts of Spain and Naples still imitated the ceremony and grandeur of Louis XIV, mingled with the pomp and exaggeration of the Castilians and Moors. They were insipid and ridiculous. The court of St. Petersburg had assumed the tone and forms of the drawing room. That of Vienna had become quite citizen-like, and there no longer remained any vestige of the wit, the grace, and the good taste of the court of Versailles. When therefore Napoleon attained the sovereign power, he found a clear road before him, and he had an opportunity of forming a court according to his own taste. He was desirous of adopting a national medium of accommodating the dignity of the throne to modern customs, and particularly by making the creation of a court contribute to improve the manners of the great and promote the industry of the mass of the people. It certainly was no easy matter to reconstruct the throne on the very spot where a reigning monarch had been judicially executed and where the people had constitutionally sworn their hatred of kings. It was not easy to restore dignities, titles, and decorations among a people who, for the space of 15 years, had waged a war of prescription against them. Napoleon, however, who seemed always to possess the power of effecting what he wished, Perhaps because he had the art of wishing for what was just and proper after great struggles surmounted all these difficulties. When he became emperor, he created a class of nobility and formed a court. Victory seemed all on a sudden to do her utmost to consolidate and shed a luster over this new order of things. All Europe acknowledged the emperor. And at one period, it might have been said that all the courts of the continent had flocked to Paris to add to the splendor of the Tuileries, which was the most brilliant and most numerous court ever seen. There was a continued series of parties, balls, and entertainments, and the court was always distinguished for extraordinary magnificence and grandeur. The person of the sovereign was alone remarkable for extreme simplicity, which indeed was a characteristic that served to distinguish him. Um, Amidst the surrounding splendor, he encouraged all this magnificence, he said, from motives of policy, and not because it accorded with his own taste. It was calculated to encourage manufacturers and national industry. The ceremonies and fests which took place on the marriage of the empress and the birth of the king of Rome far surpassed any which had preceded them and probably will never again be equaled. The emperor endeavored to establish in his foreign relations everything that was calculated to place him in harmony with the other courts of Europe, but at home he constantly tried to adapt old forms to new manners. He established the levers and couches of the old kings of France, but with him they were merely nominal and did not exist in reality as in former times. Instead of being occupied in the most minute and indelicate de details of the toilet, these hours under the emperor were in fact appropriated to receiving in the morning and dismissing in the evening such persons of his household as had to receive orders directly from him and who were privileged to pay their court to him at those times. The emperor also established special presentations to his person at admission to his court, but instead of making noble birth the only means of securing these honors, the title for obtaining them was founded solely on the combined basis of fortune, influence, and public services. Napoleon, moreover, created titles, the qualifications for which were nearly similar to those of the old feudal system. These titles, however, possessed no real value and were established for an object purely national. Those which were unaccompanied by any prerogatives or privileges might be enjoyed by persons of any rank or profession and were bestowed as rewards for all kinds of services. The emperor observed that abroad. They had the useful effect of appearing to be an approximation of the old manners of Europe, while at the same time they served as a toy for amusing the vanities of many individuals at home. For, said he, how many superior men are children oftener than once a day? 
The emperor revived decorations of honor and distributed crosses and ribbons, but instead of confining them to particular and exclusive classes, he extended them to society in general as rewards for every description and talent of public service by a happy privilege. Perhaps peculiar to Napoleon. It happened that the value of these honors was enhanced in proportion to the number distributed. He estimated that he had conferred about 25,000 decorations of the Legion of Honor and the desire to obtain the honor, he said, increased until it became a kind of mania. After the Battle of Wagram, he sent the decoration of the Legion of Honor to the Archduke Charles, and by a refinement and compliment peculiar to Napoleon, he sent him merely the silver cross, which was worn by the private soldiers. The Empress said that it was only by acting strictly and voluntarily in conformity with these maxims that he had become the real national monarch. And an adherence to the same course would have rendered the Fourth Dynasty the truly constitutional one of these facts, said he, the people of the lowest rank frequently evinced an instinctive knowledge. The emperor related the following anecdote. On returning from his coronation in Italy, as he approached the environs of Leon, he found all the population assembled on their roads to see him pass, and he took a fancy to ascend the mountain of Tarar alone. He gave orders that nobody should follow him, and mingling with the crowd, he accosted an old woman and asked what all the bustle was about. She replied that the emperor was expected. After some little conversation, he said to her, My good woman, formerly you had a tyrant cupet. Now you have the tyrant Napoleon. What have you gained by the change? The force of this argument disconcerted the old woman for a moment, but she immediately recollected herself and replied, Pardon me, sir, there's a great difference. We ourselves chose this one, but we got the other by chance. The old woman was right, said the emperor, and she exhibited more instinctive good sense than many men who are possessed of great information and talent. The emperor surrounded himself with great crown officers. He established a numerous household of chamberlains, grooms, etc. He selected persons to fill these offices indiscriminately from among those whom the revolution had elevated and from the ancient families which it had ruined, the former considered themselves as standing on ground which they had acquired, the latter on that which they thought they had recovered. The emperor had in view by this mixture of persons the extinction of hatred and the amalgamation of parties. He observed, however, that it was easy to perceive a variety of manners. The individuals belonging to the ancient families performed their duties with the greatest courtesy and assiduity. A Madame de Montmorency would have stooped down to tie the Empress's shoes. A lady of the new school would have hesitated to do this, lest she should be taken for a waiting woman. But Madame de Montmorency had no such apprehension. These posts of honor were, for the most part, without emolument. They were even attended with expense. But they brought the individuals who filled them daily under the eye of the sovereign, an all-powerful sovereign, the source of honor and grace, and who had declared that he would not have the lowest officer in his household solicited a favor from anyone but himself. At the time of his marriage to the Empress Maria Louisa, the Emperor made an extensive recruited chamberlains from among the highest ranks of the old aristocracy. This he did with the view of proving to Europe that there existed but one party in France and rallying round the Empress, those individuals whose names must have been familiar to her. It is understood that the Emperor even hesitated whether or not to select the lady of honor from that class, but his fear lest the empress, with whose character he was unacquainted, might be imbued with prejudices respecting birth that might too much elate the old party induced him to make another choice. From this moment until the period of our disasters, the most ancient and illustrious families eagerly solicited places in the household of the emperor. How could it be otherwise? The emperor governed the world. He had raised France and the French people above the level of other nations. Power, glory, constituted his retinue. Happy were they who inhaled the atmosphere of the imperial court to be immediately connected with the emperor's person furnished both abroad and at home a title to consideration, homage, and respect upon the restoration of royalists who had preserved himself pure and in whose sight 
I had found, Grace said to me in the most serious tone, for what a difference in ideas does not difference. The party produced that with my name and the openness of conduct I had maintained, I ought not to despair of still obtaining a situation near the king or in the household of some other prince or princess. How greatly was he astonished when I replied, my friend, I have rendered that impossible. I have served the most powerful master upon earth. I cannot in future without degradation stand in the same relation to any other. Know that when we conveyed the orders of the emperor to a distance into foreign courts, wearing his uniform, we considered ourselves and were everywhere treated as upon an equality with princes. He has presented to us a spectacle of no less than seven kings waiting his salutes in the midst of us and with us on his marriage. Four queens bore the robe of the, robe of the empress, of whom, moreover, one of us was the gentleman usher, and other the equerry. Trust then, my friend, that a noble ambition may be perfectly satisfied with such honors. Besides, the magnificence and splendor that composed this unexampled court rested on a system and a regularity of administration that has excited the astonishment and admiration of those who have searched amid its wreck. The emperor himself inspected the account several times. In the course of the year, all his mansions were found to be repaired and decorated. They contained nearly 40 millions in household furniture, besides 4 millions in plate. If he had enjoyed a few years of peace, imagination could scarcely fix limits, he said, to what he would have accomplished. The emperor said he had conceived and excellent idea, which he was much grieved at not having put in execution. It was to have commissioned some persons to collect the most important petitions. They should have named every day, said he, three or four individuals from the provinces who would have been admitted to my levee and have explained their business to me in person. I would have discussed it with them immediately and administered justice to them without delay. I observed to the emperor that the commission that he had created at the very early period under the name of Commission of Petitions came very near the idea in question. It was, in fact, productive of much good. I was president of it on his return from Elba, and in the first months I had already done justice to more than 4,000 petitions. It is true, I observed, that circumstances originally in custom afterwards had never allowed this establishment to enjoy the most valuable prerogative with which its organization had been endowed and which would undoubtedly have reduced the greatest effect on public opinion, namely to present to him officially at his great audience on Sunday the result of the week's labors. But the nature of things, the constant expedition to the emperor and above all, Oh, the jealousy the ministers had concurred to deprive the commission of this high privilege. The emperor said also he was sorry he had not established it as part of the etiquette of the court that all persons who had been presented, females particularly, who had any claim to obtain an audience of him should have the unquestioned right of entering the antechamber. The emperor passed through it several times in the day might have taken the opportunity to satisfy some of the requests and might in this matter have spared the refusal of audiences or the loss of time occasioned by them. The emperor had hesitated for some time, he said, about reestablishing the grand couvert of the courts of France, that is, the dining in public every Sunday of the whole imperial family. He asked our opinion of it. We differed. Some approved of it, represented this family spectacle as beneficial to public morals and fitted to produce the best effect on the public spirit besides the thing it afforded means for every individual to see his sovereign others opposed it objecting that the ceremony involves something of divine right and feudal of feudality the ignorance and servility which had no place in our habits or the modern dignity of them they might go to see the sovereigns at the church or the theater there they joined at least in the performance of of his religious duties or took part in his pleasures but to go and see him eat was only to bring ridicule on both parties the sovereignty having now become as the emperor had so well said a magistracy should only be seen in full activity conferring favors redressing injuries transacting business reviewing armies and above all divested of all the infirmities and the wants of human nature, etc. Its utility, its benefits should form its new charm. The image of the sovereign should be present continually and unlooked for like providence. Such was the new school. Such 
had been ours. Well, said the emperor, it may be true that the circumstances of the time should have limited this ceremony to the imperial heir, and only during his youth, for he was the child of the whole nation, he ought to become thenceforth the object of the sentiments and the light of all. On his return from Elba, the emperor said he had an idea of dining every Sunday in the gallery de Dien. With four or five hundred guests, this said he would undoubtedly have produced a great effect on the public, particularly at the time of the Champ de May on the assembling of the deputies from the departments at Paris. But the rapidity and the importance of business prevented it. Besides, he was apprehensive, perhaps, that there might have been observed in this measure too great affection affectation of popularity and that his enemies abroad might give it the semblance of fear on his part it is the custom said the emperor to talk of the influence of the tone and manners of the court upon those of the nation he was far from having brought about any such result but it was the fault of circumstances and of several unperceived combinations he had reflected much on the subject and he thought it would have been accomplished in time the court he continued taken collectively does not exert this influence it is only because it's elements those who compose it go to communicate each in his own sphere of action that which they have collected from the common source the tone of the court then is not infused into a whole nation but through intermediate societies now we had no such societies nor could we yet have them those delightful assemblies where one enjoys so fully the advantages of civilization suddenly disappear at the approach of revolutions and are reestablished but slowly when the tempest dissipate the indispensable basis of company are indolence and luxury but we were all still in a state of agitation and great fortunes were not yet firmly established a great number of theaters a multitude of public establishments moreover presented pleasures more ready less constrained and more exciting the women of the day taken collectively were young they liked better to be out and to show themselves in public than to remain at home and compose a narrower circle but they would have grown old and with a little time and tranquility everything would have fallen into its natural course and then again he observed it would perhaps be an error to judge of a modern court by the remembrance of the old ones. The power certainly resided in the old courts, they said, the court and the city at the present day. If we desired to speak correctly, we were obliged to say the city and the court. The feudal lords, since they have lost their power, seek to make themselves amends in their enjoyments. Sovereigns themselves seem to be for the future subjected to this law, the throne with our liberal ideas insensibly ceased to be a seigneury and became purely a magistracy the prince having only a simple practical character to sustain always sufficiently dull and tedious in the long run must seek to withdraw from it to come as a mere citizen and take his share in the charms of society among a great number of new measures projected by the emperor for a more tranquil fortuity his favorite idea had been peace being obtained and repose secured to devote his life to purifying the administration and the local ameliorations to be occupied in perpetual tours in the departments. He would have visited, not hurried over, sojourned, not posted through. He would have used his own horses would have been surrounded by the empress, the king of Rome, his whole court. At the same time, he wished this great equipage not to be burdensome to any, but rather benefit to all a suite of tapestry hangings and all the other appendages following in the train would have furnished and decorated his places of rest. The other person to the court, he said, would have been quartered on the citizens who would have looked upon their guests as a benefit rather than a burden because they would always have been the sure means of acquiring some advantage or some favors it is thus he continued that i should have been able in every place to prevent frauds punish misappropriations direct edifices bridges roads drains marshes fertilized lands etc if heaven had then he continued granted me a few years i would certainly have made paris the capital of the world and all France, a real fairyland. He often repeated these last words. How many people have already said this or will repeat it after him? 
the six. The emperor mounted his horse at seven o'clock, told me to call my son to accompany us. This was a great favor. During our ride, the emperor dismounted five or six times to observe with the help of glass some vessels that were in sight. He ascertained one to be a Dutchman. The three colors are always with us, an object of sentiment and of lively emotion. On one of these occasions, the most meddlesome horse in the company got loose and occasioned a long pursuit. My son came up with him, brought him back in triumph, and the emperor observed that in a tournament. This would be a victory. On our return, the emperor breakfasted within doors. He detained us all before and after breakfast. The emperor conversed with me in private on serious matters, which I cannot trust the paper. The heat was become excessive. He retired. It was half past four when he sent for me again. He was finishing dressing. The doctor brought him a set of chessmen, which he had been buying on board the vessels from China. The emperor had wished to have one. For this, he had paid 30 Napoleons. It was an object of great admiration with the worthy doctor. And at the same time, nothing seemed more ridiculous to the emperor. All the pieces, instead of resembling ours, were coarse and clumsy images of the figures indicated by the names. Thus, a knight was armed at all points, and the castle rested on an enormous elephant, ETC. The emperor could not make use of them, saying pleasantly that every piece would require a crane to move it. In the meantime, many officers and others employed in the China fleet were sauntering in the garden. Their curiosity had led them some hours before to our dwelling. We had been literally invaded in our chambers. One said the pride of his life would be to have seen Napoleon. And other that he durst not appear in his wife's presence in England. If you could not tell her that he had been fortunate enough to behold his features, and other, that he would willingly forego all of the profits of his voyage for a single glance. Each, you see, the emperor caused them to be admitted. It would be difficult to describe their satisfaction and joy. They had not ventured to expect or to hope for so much. The emperor, according to custom, proposed many questions to them concerning China, its commerce, its inhabitants, their revenues, their manners, their missionaries, etc. He detained them above half an hour before he dismissed them. At their departure, we described to him the enthusiasm we had witnessed in these officers and repeated all that had fallen from them relative to him. I believe it, said he. You do not perceive that they are our friends. All that you have observed in them belongs to the commons of England. The natural enemies perhaps without giving themselves credit for it, of their old and insolent aristocracy. At dinner, the emperor ate little. He was unwell. After coffee, he attempted a game of chess, but he was too much inclined for sleep and retired almost immediately. The seventh, the emperor mounted his horse at a very early hour. He told me again to call my son to accompany him. The evening before, the emperor, seeing my horse back, had asked me if I did not make him learn to groom his horse that nothing was more useful, that he had given particular orders for it in the military school as such your man. I was vexed that such an idea had escaped me. I seized it eagerly, and my son still more so. He was at this moment on a horse that no one had touched but himself. The emperor, whom I informed of it, seemed pleased and condescended to make him go through a sort of little examination. Our ride lasted nearly two hours and a half, rambling all the time about Longwood. At our return, the emperor had breakfast in the garden in which he detained us all. A short time before dinner, I presented myself as usual in the drawing room. The emperor was playing at chess with the grand marshal, the valet de chambre, and waiting at the door of their room. Brought me a letter in which was written, very urgent. Out of respect for the emperor, I went aside to read it. It was in English. It stated that I had composed an excellent work, that nevertheless, it was not without faults. <laughs> If I would correct them in a new edition, no doubt, but the work would be more valuable for it. And then went on to pray that God would keep me in his gracious, gracious and holy protection. Such a letter excited my astonishment and made me rather angry. The color rushed to my face. I did not at first give myself time to consider the writing. In reading it over again, I recognized the hand notwithstanding its being much better written than usual. And I could not help laughing a good deal to myself. But the emperor, who cast a side glance at me, asked me from whom the letter came that was given to me.
<laughs> I replied that it was a paper that had caused a very different feeling in me at first from that which it would leave permanently. I said this was so much simplicity. The mystification had been so complete that he laughed till tears came in his eyes. The letter was from him. The pupil had a mind that jest with his matter, master, and try his powers at his expense. That's funny. I carefully preserved this letter, the gaiety, the style, and the whole circumstance rendered it more valuable to me than any diploma the emperor could have put into my hands when he was in power. The eighth, the emperor had had no sleep during the night. He had therefore amused himself with writing me in another letter in English. He said it to me sealed. I corrected the errors in it. And sent him an answer also in English by the return of the courier. He understood me perfectly. This convinced him of the progress he had made and satisfied him that for the future he could, strictly speaking, correspond in his new tongue. For nearly a fortnight past, General Gorgow had been unwell. His indisposition had turned a very malignant dysentery, which occasioned some alarm. The admiral now sent him, the surgeon of the Northumberland, Dr. Warden, the emperor, detained this gentleman at dinner during the repast, and for a long time afterwards, the conversation was exclusively on medicine, sometimes lively, sometimes serious and profound. The emperor was in good spirits. He talked with a great volubility. He overwhelmed the doctor with questions and with ingenious and subtle arguments that perplexed him much. The latter was much dazzled by this brilliancy, so that after dinner he took me aside and asked me how it happened that the emperor was so well informed on these matters. He did not doubt that they were his usual topics of conversation. Not more than anything else, I said with truth. But there are a few subjects with which the emperor is unacquainted, and he treats them all in a new and engaging manner. The emperor has no faith in medicine or its remedies, of which he makes no use. Doctor said he, our body is a machine for the purpose of life. It is organized to that end. That is its nature. Leave the life there at its ease. Let it take care of itself. It will do better than if you paralyze it by loading it with medicines. It is like a well-made watch destined to go for a certain time. The watchmaker has not the power of opening it. He cannot meddle with it, but at random and with his eyes, bandaged for one who by dint of racking it with his ill-formed instruments succeeds in doing it any good how many blockheads destroy it all together the emperor then did not admit the utility of medicine but in a few cases in disorders that were known and distinctly ascertained by time and experience and he then compared the art of the physician with that of the engineer. In regular sieges where the maxims of Vauban and the rules of experience have brought all their chances within the scope of known laws in accordance to with these principles, the emperor had conceived the idea of a law which should have allowed to the mass of medical practitioners in France the use of simple medicines only and forbidden them to employ heroic remedies, that is, such as may cause death unless they may three or four thousand francs at least by the profession which said he afforded grounds for supposing them to have education judgment and a certain public reputation this measure said he was certainly just and beneficent but in my circumstances it was unseasonable information was not yet sufficiently diffused no doubt but the mass of the people would have only seen an act of tyranny in the law, which notwithstanding would have rescued them from their executioners. The emperor had frequently attacked the celebrated Corvisar, his physician, upon the subject of medicine. The latter, waiving the honor of the profession and of his colleagues, confessed that he entertained nearly the same opinion and even acted upon them. He was a great enemy to medicines and had employed them very sparingly. The Empress Maria Louisa, suffering much during her pregnancy and teasing him for relief, he artfully gave her some pills composed of crumb of bread, which she observed did her a great deal of good. The emperor said he had brought Corvisar to admit that medicine was a resource available only for the few, that it might be of some benefit to the rich, but that it was the scourge of the poor. Now, do you not believe, said the emperor, that seeing the uncertainty of the art itself and the ignorance of those who practice it, its effects taken in the aggregate are more fatal than useful to the people. 
Corvusar assented without hesitation. But have you never killed anybody yourself? Continued the Emperor. That is to say, have not some patients died, evidently in consequence of your prescriptions. Undoubtedly replied Corvusar, but I ought no more to let that weigh upon my conscience than would your majesty if you had caused the destruction of some troops. Not from having made a bad movement, but because their march was impeded by a ditch or a precipice, which it was impossible for you to be aware of. Then the emperor went on to some problems and definitions which he proposed to the doctor. What is life? said he to him. When and how do we receive it? Is that anything but mystery yet? Then he defined harmless madness to be a vacancy or incoherence of judgment between just ideas and the application of them. An insane man eats grapes in a vineyard that is not his own. And in reply to the expostulations of the owner says, Here are two of us. The sun shines upon us. And I have a right to eat these grapes. The dangerous madman was he in whom this vacancy or incoherence of judgment occurred between ideas and actions. It was he who cut off the head of a sleeping man and concealed himself behind a hedge to enjoy the perplexity of the dead body when it should wake. The emperor next asked the doctor what was the difference between sleep and death and answered the question himself by saying that sleep was the momentary suspension of the faculties within the power of our volition and death, the lasting suspension. Not only these faculties, but also of those over which our will has no control. From that conversation turned upon the plague, the emperor maintained that it was taken by inspiration as well as by contact. He said that it was rendered most dangerous and most extensively propagated by fear. Its principal seat was in the imagination in Egypt. All those in whom that the imagination was affected perished. The most prudent remedy was moral courage. He had touched with impunity, he said, some infected persons at Jaffa and had saved many lives by deceiving the soldiers during two months as to the nature of the disease. It was not the plague, they were told, but a fever accompanied with ulcers. Moreover, he had observed that the best means to preserve the army from it were to keep them on the march and give them plenty of exercise, fatigue, and the occupation of the mind upon other subjects were found the surest protection, ETC. The emperor also said to the doctor, if Hippocrates were on a sudden to enter your hospital, would he not be much astonished? Would he adopt your maxims and your methods? Would he not find fault with you on your part? Would you understand his language? Would you at all comprehend each other? He concluded by pleasantly extolling the practice of medicine in Babylon, where the patients were exposed at the door, and the relations sitting near them stopped the passages to inquire if they had ever been afflicted in a similar way, and what had cured them. One had at least a certainty, said he, of escaping all those whose remedies had killed them. Ninth, I was breakfasting with the emperor after our English lesson when I received a letter from my wife that filled me with joy and gratitude. She said that neither fear, fatigue, nor distance could prevent her from joining me. That, that's sweet, separated from me, she could experience no happiness and that she was only waiting for the proper season. Admiral devotion superior to all that we have manifested here inasmuch as it exerted with the perfect knowledge all of its consequences. I cannot think that in England they will have the cruelty to refuse him. her. What does she solicit? Favors, interest? No, she begs to share the lot of an exile on a solitary rock to fulfill a duty and to testify her affection. How far was I from forming a just estimate of the hearts and minds of those who detained us, Madame de las Casas found herself constantly repulsed, sometimes under various pretexts, sometimes even without an answer at last. And as if to rid himself of her importunity, Lord Bathurst caused her to be informed in the beginning of 1817 that she would be permitted to go to the Cape of Good Hope, 500 leagues beyond St. Helena, for whence... If the governor of St. Helena, Sir Hudson Lowe, sees no objection, she will be allowed to join her husband. I leave without comment this specimen of ill-timed pleasantry to the consideration of anyone who has the feelings of a man. This letter came by the Owen Glendower frigate, which arrived from the Cape.
and brought us at the same time, the European papers, to December the 4th, the 10th through the 12th. The weather had now changed to those miserable pelting rains, which scarcely permitted us to walk in the garden. Fortunately, we had newspapers to occupy our time. At length, I had the satisfaction of seeing the emperor read them without assistance. These papers contained many details relating to the trial of Marshal Ney, who was at that time in progress. With reference to this, the emperor said that the horizon was gloomy, that the unfortunate marshal was certainly in great danger, but that we must not, however, despair. The king undoubtedly believes himself quite sure of the peers, said he. They are certainly violent enough, firmly resolved, highly incensed, but for all that, suppose the slightest incident, some new rumor, or I know not what, then you would see, in spite of all the efforts of the king, and of what they believe to be the interest of their cause, the chamber of peers would all on a sudden take it into their heads not to find him guilty, and thus the name may be saved. This led the emperor to dilate upon our volatile, fickle, and changeable disposition. All the French said he are turbulent and disposed to rail, but they are not addicted to seditious combinations, still less to actual conspiracy. Their levity is so natural to them, their change is so sudden that it may be said to be a national dishonor. They are mere weathercocks, the sport of the winds, it is true, but this vice is with them free from the calculation of interest and that is their best excuse but we must only be understood to speak here of a mass of that which constitutes public opinion for individual examples to the contrary have swarmed in our latter times that exhibit certain classes in the most disgusting state of meanness it was this knowledge of the national character the emperor continued and it always prevented his having recourse to the high court. It was instituted by our constitution. The Council of State had even decreed its organization, but the emperor felt all the sudden danger of the bustle and agitation that such spectacles always produce. Such a proceeding, he said, was in reality an appeal to the public and was always highly injurious to authority when the accused gained the cause. A ministry in England might sustain without inconvenience the effects of a decision against it under such circumstances, but a sovereign like me, and situated as I was, could not have suffered it without the utmost danger to public affairs. For this reason, I preferred having recourse to the ordinary tribunals. Malevolence often started objections to this, but nevertheless, among all those whom it was pleased to call victims, which of them, I ask of you, has retained his popularity in our late struggles? They have taken care to justify me. All of them are fated in the national estimation. The emperor had reserved one article in the papers that he might have. My assistance in reading it, it referred to the carriage he lost in Waterloo. The great number of technical expressions rendered it too difficult for him. The editor gave a very circumstantial account of this carriage with a minutely detailed inventory of all of its contents. To this, he sometimes added the most frivolous reflections in mentioning a small liquor case. He observed that the emperor never forgot himself, but took care to want nothing. In noticing certain elegant appendages to his dressing case, he added that it might be seen he made his toilet comme il faut, the expression used in French. These last words produced a sensation of the emperor, which certainly would not have been excited by a more important subject. How? said he to me, with a mixture of disgust and pain. These people of England, then take me for some wild animal. Have they really been led so far as this? Or are there blank, who is a kind of ox apis, I am assured? Does he not pay that attention to his toilet that is considered proper by every person of any education amongst us? It is certain that I should have been a good deal puzzled to explain him the writer's meaning. Besides, it is known that the emperor of all people in the world set the least value on his personal convenience and studied it the least. But on the other hand, and he acknowledged it with pleasure, there never was one for whom the devotion and attention of servants had been so diligent in that particular. He ate at very irregular hours, they contrived in the course of his journeys and campaigns to have his dinner similar to what he was accustomed to at the Tuileries. He always 
ready within a few paces of him, had he but to speak, and he was instantly served. He himself said it was magic. During 15 years, he constantly drank a particular sort of burgundy, Chambertin, which he liked and believed to be wholesome for him. He found this wine provided for him throughout Germany, in the remotest part of Spain, everywhere, even in Moscow, etc. And it may truly be said that art, luxury, and refinement of elegance and good taste contended around him, as if without his knowledge to afford him gratification. The English journalists therefore described a multitude of objects that were undoubtedly in the carriage, but of which the emperor had not the slightest notion. Not that he was at all surprised at it, he observed. The bad weather, which continued to confine us within doors, had no influence on the disposition of the emperor, who at this particular time seemed more unreserved and talked more than usual. He spoke at length and with the most minute details of the famous interview at Dresden. The following are extracts from his conversation. This was the epic when the power of Napoleon was at its height. He there appeared as the king of kings. He was actually obliged to observe that some attention ought to be paid to the emperor of Austria, his father-in-law. Neither the sovereign nor the king of Prussia had any household establishment attending them. Alexander had none either at Tilsit or Erfurt there as at Dresden. They lived at, the Napo at Napoleon's table. These courts said the emperor were paltry and vulgar. It was he who regulated the etiquette and took the lead in them. He made Francis take precedence of him to his unbounded satisfaction. The luxury and magnificence of Napoleon must have made him appear like an Asiatic prince to them. There, as well as at Tilsit, he loaded all who came near him with diamonds. We informed him that at Dresden he had not a single French soldier near him, and that his court was sometimes not without apprehensions for the safety of his person. He could scarcely believe us, but we assured him that it was a fact that the Saxon bodyguard was the only one he had. It is all one, he said. I was then in so good a family with such worthy people that I ran no risk. I was beloved by all, and at this very time, I am sure the good king of Saxony repeats every day a patter and an ave for me. He added, I ruined the fortunes of that poor Princess Augusta, and I acted very wrong in doing so. Returning from Tilsit, I received at Marion Verder, a chamberlain of the King of Saxony, who delivered me a letter from his master. He wrote thus, I have just received a letter from the Emperor of Austria, who desires my daughter in marriage. I send you this, that you may inform me what answer I ought to return. I shall be addressed in a few days, was the reply of the Emperor. And on his arrival, he set his face against the match and prevented it. I was very wrong, repeated he. I was fearful the Emperor Francis with, would withdraw the King of Saxony from me. On the contrary, the Princess Augusta would have brought over the Emperor Francis to my side. And I should now, I should not now have been here. At Dresden, Napoleon was much occupied in business. And Maria Louisa, anxious to avail herself of the smallest intervals of leisure to be with her husband, scarcely ever went out lest she should miss them. The Emperor Francis, who did nothing and tired himself all day with going about the town, could not at all comprehend this family's seclusion. He fancied that it was to affect reserve and importance. The Empress of Austria endeavored to get Maria Luisa to go out. She represented to her that her constant assiduity was ridiculous. She would willingly have given herself the airs of a stepmother with Maria Luisa, who was not disposed to suffer it, their age being nearly the same. She came frequently in the morning of her toilette, ransacking among the luxurious and magnificent objects displayed there. She seldom went out empty-handed. The reign of Maria Luisa was very short, said the emperor, but it must have been full of enjoyment for her. She had the world at her feet. One of us took the liberty to ask if the Empress of Austria was not the sworn enemy of Maria Luisa. Nothing more, said the emperor, than a little regular court hatred and thorough detestation in the heart, but glossed over by daily letters of four pages full of coaxing and tenderness.
Just like Maria Luisa, the Empress of Austria was particularly attentive to Napoleon and took great pains to make much of them while he was present. But no sooner was his back turned that she endeavored to detach Maria Luisa from him by the most mischievous and malicious insinuations. She was vexed that she could not succeed in obtaining some influence over her. She has, however, addressed an ability, said the Emperor, and that's sufficient to embarrass her husband, who had acquired a conviction that she entertained a poor opinion of him. Her countenance was agreeable engaging and had something very peculiar in it she was a pretty little nun as to the emperor francis his good nature is well known and makes him constantly the dupe of the designing his son will be like him the king of prussia as a private character is an honorable good and worthy man but in his political capacity he is naturally disposed to yield to necessity he is always commanded by whomsoever has power to sign and seems about about to strike. As to the Emperor of Russia, he is a man infinitely superior to these. He possesses wit, grace, information. It's fascinating, but he is not to be trusted. He is devoid of candor, a true Greek of the lower empire. At the same time, he is now without ideology, real or assumed. After all, may only be a smattering derived from his education and his preceptor. Would you believe, said the Emperor? What I had to discuss with him, he maintained that inheritance was an abuse in monarchy, and I had to spend more than an hour and employ all my eloquence and logic in proving to him that this right constituted the peace and happiness of the people. It may be, too, that he was mystified, for he is cunning, false, and expert, blank. He will push his fortunes. If I die here, he will be my real heir in Europe. I alone was able to stop him with his deluge of Tartars. The crisis is great and will have lasting effects upon the continent of Europe, especially upon Constantinople. He was solicitous with me for the possession of it. I have had much coaxing on this subject, but I constantly turn a deaf ear to it. It was necessary that that empire, shattered as it appeared, should constantly remain a point of separation between us. It was the marsh that prevented my right from being turned. As to Greece, it is another matter. And after talking a while upon that country, he renewed the subject. Greece awaits a liberator. There will be a brilliant crown of glory. He will inscribe his name forever with those of Homer, Plato, and Epinomandas. I, perhaps, was not far from it. When, during my campaign in Italy, I arrived on the shores of the Adriatic, I wrote to the directory that I had before my eyes the kingdom of Alexander. Still later, I entered into engagements with Ali Pasha, and when Corfu was taken from us, they must have found their ammunition and a complete equipment for an army of 40, 50,000 men. I had caused maps to be made, Macedonia, Serbia, Albania, ETC.